Now to a different kind of medical controversy, one that became a historic legal battle. It involved an organ transplant, one of medicine's great miracles. Though transplants save thousands of lives every year, there is a shortage of organs, partly because of the fear that the procedure could be abused. Well, the dedicated young surgeon in our next story was the first doctor accused of doing just that, trying to save the life of one patient by hastening the death of another. Here's Keith Morrison. A small hospital, the central California coast. A massive heart attack. The patient was still alive, though barely. He was in a deep coma. Only a ventilator kept him breathing. His name was Ruben Navarro, just 25 years old. And in this perilous state, he was about to make medical history. Because, 200 miles up the coast in San Francisco, a phone call. It's like being a fireman. You slide down the pole and go to the airport. But he's not a fireman. Dr. Hutan Ruzrock is a brilliant surgeon. The call, a plea to save a life. The operation I had done hundreds of times. Now there was no time to lose. Dr. Ruzrock and his highly skilled medical team raced to the airport, boarded a chartered plane, and took off down the coast towards San Luis Obispo. And then, the fog. The fog was very bad in San Luis Obispo. Ruzrock's flight was rerouted to a distant airport. Cars had to be located, a caravan formed, time lost. All in the fog, you know, middle of the night, Friday night. By the time Dr. Ruzrock arrived, most of the hospital staff had left for the weekend. No one was prepared. No one knew what to do. No one knew what the next step was. Nothing was ready. Nothing. No one was there. But by now, the die was cast. A real-life medical drama was reaching its climax. But this much we know before the drama begins. Hutan Ruzrock did not come here to save Ruben's life. His mission was to wait for Reuben to die and then harvest his organs. For 98% of these cases to go forward, someone has to die. Hutan Ruzrock was a transplant surgeon. The life he'd been called to save was that of a woman desperately waiting for a new liver. Reuben Navarro's liver. A young man whose impending death was about to sow chaos in the lives of those around him. Ruben's journey to the final night of his life began long ago in second grade. He was always happy. He was a very perfect person. Perfect person? Perfect. Nobody's when perfect. He was, really? I know. But when he come to do the homework, he wanted to be perfect. He was unusually bright, little Ruben. His teachers told his mother, Rosa, he could go far, her bright star of a son. I'm a single mom. So, and I'm proud of it. He was all you had in the world. That's it. He was the world to me and my inspiration. Love of your life. Exactly. Perfect. But within a year, perfection gave way to mysterious flaws in Reuben's behavior. When did you first notice that something was wrong? When he was eight. That's when Reuben, who loved math, began struggling with simple arithmetic. And I would say, why? You forgot to do timetables and divisions. Just say you did great, and now you, you don't know how to do Just like that? Exactly. And as his mind slipped, Reuben also began losing control of his body. He would be walking, or he would be bumping onto the chair, or the furniture, or whatever. And he was overcome with unbearable pain as his limbs degraded and his brain slowed. It was, said the doctors, a rare neurological disorder. Devastating. Comes out of the blue, doesn't it? Exactly. And I think to myself, why me? And why him? By the time he was a teenager, Reuben was taken far away to live in one group home after another on constant medication. Finally, ending up in a nursing home, likely unaware of the idyllic town around him. San Luis Obispo, along California's central coast. It was here on January 29, 2006, that Reuben, just 25, had a massive heart attack and was taken to Sierra Vista Hospital in a coma. Rosa, without a car of her own, 
took the train from her little apartment hundreds of miles to the south to be by Reuben's side. But soon after she arrived, she said, the calls began from the organ transplant network. And they say, if I wanted to donate his organs, and I said no. They were attacked, but they kept on calling and calling and calling. Then she says a doctor began to hound her. And he goes, the only thing I can do for patients like him, just disconnect them and that's it. Did so, he say how, whether or not Ruben would survive? The only thing, he goes, five days in the machine, I have to disconnect him, and there's nothing I can do for him. That's why he said, and he walked away, like, you didn't care. That they wanted to sign up paper to um, donate his organs, because they said he's going to die. But Rosa, deep in her grief and unable to accept her son would die, says she refused. I didn't sign no paper, no nothing. But events were now in motion, and nothing would stop them. It was the night of February 1st, 2006, 10.50 p.m., when the whole fateful business began. That's the moment when the name Ruben Navarro was placed on the list of possible organ donors. The next morning, February 2nd, Rosa went to the hospital, as this video she provided shows, to pray at Ruben's bedside. When did you realize that your son was going to die? that he was not going to come back from this. Did you understand that right away when they no, called No, he didn't look like he wasn't going to die. He was trying to open his eyes, like he wanted to speak. But he couldn't speak. He couldn't speak, he was so doped up. That's why I knew he wasn't ready to go, because he was crying. She was poor, her money was gone, and so she couldn't stay to keep watch over her son. I was broke, because I needed to pay the, the hotel to eat. And so, heartbroken, exhausted, alone, she said goodbye to Reuben. At noon, she boarded a train for the long ride home to Southern California. So if you had been able to afford to stay with your son... Yes, I would have stayed. It was 1.15 p.m. there on the homebound train, now well underway, when her cell phone rang. Hello? Hi, Rosie. Hello, it's Catherine. The caller was from the California Transplant Donor Network, a nonprofit group that acts like a placement center for patients in need of organs. Rosa said she thought she'd fended off earlier donation requests, but this time it seemed more official. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read some things to you, and you don't need to say anything, okay? You're thinking about doing, you're going to do cremation. So when you were getting those calls on the train, yeah, he was still alive. Yes. And they said he was still alive, but he's going to die very soon. Yeah. The thing is, they lie. He was ready to go. Or at least that's what Rosa thought. Grieving, alone, surrounded by strangers on the train, Rosa was confronted again with a request. Would she agree to make Reuben's organs available for transplantation? With him being so young, you know, he could save seven people's lives. That would have been the... I know. I know. Can I have your address, Rosie, so we can send you the letter about the recipients? What were you thinking when you got off that phone call? Well, I got in shock. I became blurry. I was confused. Four minutes into the phone call Rosa found so confusing, she gives what sounds like implicit consent to have Reuben's organs donated. If we, if we, if we, if we oh, organs are okay enough, why not use them, you know, for, for uh, people that really need them? And indeed, the need for donated organs is real and urgent. Without question, Reuben's organs had the potential to save lives now hanging in desperate balance. So, soon after the phone call to Rosa, the transplant network contacted Reuben's doctor with the news. Your patient is a candidate. So what the doctor wrote later in his medical chart was, to say the least, curious. I doubt Reuben will succumb immediately upon extubation. Meaning? Once Reuben was disconnected from the ventilator, his organs would not be getting enough oxygen and would slowly degrade. And by the time he died, perhaps hours later, 
They'd be useless for transplantation. Did anyone notice? By then the drama had commenced. And up in San Francisco, 6 p.m., night of February 2nd, Dr. Roosrock got the call to harvest Reuben's organs. The recipient surgeon said, are you available? Can you go down and do this procurement? I said, yes. The organ procurement procedure could get complicated, the caller said. Why? Because Reuben was not brain dead, like most donor patients, but instead in a coma. So their brain is still alive. The legal requirements for brain death have not been met. Most organ donors are accident victims. They've suffered a fatal brain injury. They've been declared legally dead by the time the transplant team arrives. But Reuben had been placed in a somewhat controversial category called DCD, or donation after cardiac death. Medical jargon, of course, but very rare. What happens in a case like that is the patient is still alive on an operating table when the transplant team arrives, connected to a ventilator. The hospital must disconnect the ventilator. The transplant team waits for the patient to die and then the operation can proceed. The procedure is so rare that though Dr. Roosbrock had participated in 300 transplant operations, only one had been a DCD case. As Ruben Navarro drifted in the netherworld between this existence and whatever awaits beyond, he was or may have been unresponsive to the outside world, but he was technically alive. How much so? That will be a question asked many times throughout the coming night. It was the fog. On the afternoon of February 2nd, 2006, a great white bank of fog advanced along the California coast from San Francisco south to a town called San Luis Obispo, where the life of Ruben Navarro was slowly slipping away. It was the fog that delayed Hutan Ruzrock's team on their mission to save a patient in desperate need of a liver transplant. A mission which, over and over, presents difficult choices for grieving families and some new hope for potential recipients. There is such a gap right now between people on the list and people who actually donate. And there's so much fear and misconception out there that this gap, instead of getting smaller, it's getting larger. So anytime some possibility comes up of organs becoming available, that's a big deal. Absolutely. Absolutely. This time, or so it seemed, as Roosrock flew south to harvest Ruben Navarro's organs, the biggest issue was simply the fog. We had to reroute. We found and got clearance to land at Paso Robles. So then you had to go by car up to the hospital. Correct. And you know, you don't have, like, chauffeurs waiting for you. You're doing all this stuff yourself. You know, you're empty in the plane. You got your duffel bags. You're taking everything. It was late, almost 11 p.m., when they pulled into the parking lot of Sierra Vista Hospital. Roosrock's brief and life-changing encounter with Ruben Navarro was just minutes away. Ruben's own doctor had left town for the weekend, and a backup had to be called. It would be that backup doctor's job to be Ruben's attending physician Look out for him alone, see to his medical needs, especially including any prescriptions which might be needed for pain or anything else. But when Roosrock looked in on Reuben at the ICU, that doctor was not around. That person didn't want to come in until we were in the operating room. She refused to come in. I don't get it. I don't either. You knew we were coming. We were actually late. Reuben was comatose, but still alive, still on a ventilator, and could possibly experience pain once the ventilator was removed. They're suffocating for all intents and purposes. They're gasping for air. They're suffering. At 11.20 p.m., Reuben was wheeled from ICU to the operating room, and in his wake, further confusion. Two OR nurses were asked to help with the procedure, an ICU nurse as well. There was, in addition, a transplant coordinator, a transplant assistant, a respiratory therapist, an assistant surgeon. There was Hutan Ruzrock and Ruben's own backup doctor. An ad hoc group of individuals thrown together late on a Friday night to perform a rare type of harvesting procedure full of ethical dilemmas. Once in the OR, a nurse administered the painkillers, the morphine and Ativan, which had been prescribed earlier by Dr. Ruzrock. Basically, to prevent his suffering. The least we can do as physicians 
is make them comfortable. It's the only humane thing to do. And that's why I felt it was important that those medications were available. Then they disconnected his ventilator, but Reuben continued to breathe. The part of his brain that would control breathing was alive. But without the ventilator to fill his lungs with oxygen, Reuben's organs would degrade and be worthless within an hour. At that point, according to suggested protocols, Dr. Ruzrock and the transplant team should have left the operating room to wait outside. But they did not. There is a feeling by some people that it may be a conflict of interest for the transplant surgeon to be in the operating room while the patient is still viable. In essence, you know, you're waiting for him to die. Maybe it's not such a good thing to be in the room. Isn't that what some of the protocols suggest? Yes. And yet you were there. Why? We were in the room that particular night because we were asked to be in the room. By whom? By Carla Albright. Nurse Carla Albright was the transplant coordinator. You'll hear more about her later. She had actually been in San Luis Obispo a couple of days to lay the groundwork for the procedure. If Ruzrock was the star of the team, Albright was, say, the quarterback, the one actually calling the shots. When Ruzrock decided he would stay in the operating room that night, it was because he, and presumably Albright, felt things were starting to slip out of control. In the operating room, no one knew what they were doing. These people had never seen a DCD procurement before. And it's midnight in a small town. They don't know us from anything. Right. You could just get that sense that people were tense. In part because Reuben was still very much alive. When we put him on that table that night yeah. and we stretched his arms out, we felt resistance. He was aware of what was going on. We put his arms out like this, and he didn't want that done. Why would he not want his arm? It's uncomfortable. He didn't like it. It was painful for him. How do you know it was painful? I put myself where he was. If that was me, how would I react? What would I be feeling? I thought I could feel pain. So Dr. Rizrock directed that more morphine and Ativan be given to Reuben. And since Reuben was still a living patient, his vital signs were closely monitored and recorded. That job fell to the transplant coordinator, Nurse Carla Albright. As part of a DCD, the uh, coordinator's responsibility is minute by minute to document heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, essentially his vital signs. Those vital signs would be clear indicators if Reuben was feeling pain or panic. As a human being, you would want the person not to suffer, to go as peaceful as possible. Yet something in Reuben fought to stay alive. Each time he was given an injection of morphine and Ativan, his heart rate slowed, his breathing eased, but within minutes both would shoot up again, indicating the drugs were having little effect. By midnight, 40 minutes into the procedure, 20 minutes remaining of organ viability. Reuben had been given 100 milligrams of morphine and 40 milligrams of Ativan. Despite the heavy dose of painkillers, Dr. Ruzrock was worried that Reuben was still suffering. So another 100 milligrams of morphine and 40 milligrams of Ativan were brought to the OR. Minutes ticked down. Soon, Reuben's organs wouldn't be usable. No one said anything. There was silence. It was just waiting and watching. And when that reached approximately one hour, that's when I said we've waited, you know, long enough. He hasn't died. Let me call the recipient surgeon and inform him. And while Reuben stayed alive, another patient now had to prepare to die. For back in San Francisco, the operation to save a life to transplant Reuben's liver into a dying woman was aborted. So then what did he do? Thanked everyone for coming in and left. That's it. it and like Reuben was still alive. Correct. But not for much longer. Reuben was returned to ICU. A do not resuscitate order was placed in his chart. A nurse who sat with him as he died said later that whenever she held his hand, his heart rate would increase. Finally, at 8.15 in the morning on February 3rd, Reuben Navarro's painful journey came to an end. Bye. Putin Ruzrock and Ruben Navarro's lives were still very much entwined because four months later, one of the operating room nurses, Jennifer Ensley, walked into the San Luis Obispo Police Department with a story to tell. 
I knew something was dreadfully wrong, that this was just not right. Angeli seemed sure something sinister occurred that night in the OR. And the mastermind behind it all? is what they call them. In San Luis Obispo, nurse Jennifer Ensley unloaded on police, telling them everything she could about Ruben Navarro's final hours. She pored over photos and sketched out diagrams of the OR and laid out a very disturbing tale. It just did not feel right to me. Nurse Ensley told them that Ruben was alive when they rolled him into the ER, told them how the transplant doctor ordered massive quantities of potentially lethal drugs, how he refused to leave the OR and how he seemed a little too anxious to her to dismiss Reuben's faint heartbeat as nothing more than post-mortem twitching. You can see his heart beating through his chest. Ensley thought it wise to conduct her own investigation as the night unfolded. I want to know what's going on. You're not sure. It's all going to be nice. I'm kind of peering over and I'm walking over there. I want to see. That's, I mean, I was being nosy. I'll, I'll fully admit it. I don't need to know. I was being sick of being ignored. So she says she even confronted another nurse about the amount of drugs being injected. I said, what and how much did you get? And she said, 220 of morphine and 84 Ativan. I said, are you kidding me? Ansley said she was the only one to ask questions or raise concerns. I did not feel as if I could do any more. Is that besides sprawling myself across the patient room. Out of everybody in the room who ran the show. That's such a loaded question. Officially? No. Or who by was actions. By by actions. Dr. Mutan? Nurse Ensley was very persuasive. So much so that after her two hour interview, detectives filed a report suggesting charges could be laid. One of the charges they considered? California Penal Code 664187, attempted murder. Back in San Francisco, Hutan Roosrock and his wife Sherry were unaware that police were investigating the Navarro case until the day detectives came knocking at their door. They showed up to my house on my wedding anniversary, my front door on a Sunday. There were endless questions. It was obvious charges were possible perhaps even attempted murder. The first reaction is, they're going to do what? I mean, these were people that thought I tried to murder somebody. We were terrified. What do you do? What do you do? Where do you go? We didn't know any attorneys. Suddenly, in the course of an afternoon, an immensely promising career came crashing down. What was that time like for you? Shame. Prodigal son does wrong. Prodigal? Ruzrock grew up in the Midwest, the enormously gifted son of Iranian immigrants. He was accepted into a combined undergrad medical school program at the University of Wisconsin when he was just 16 years old. By 24, he had his MD. And by his 31st birthday, he was the youngest transplant surgeon in the country. He wanted to be at the forefront of saving as many lives as he possibly could. His mother actually died needing a liver transplant. Before all of this happened, what was your sense of, and his, of where he was in his career, what he had achieved? On track. Ahead of schedule. <laughs> Just living at the top of the world. Everything was perfect. And now, apparently, it was all over. Oh, everything changed. Everything changed. Absolutely everything changed. My colleagues weren't calling me. I was alone on an island. And then the word came. Local prosecutors have filed charges against a San Francisco transplant surgeon. On July 30th, 2007, Dr. Hutan Ruzrock was charged, not with attempted murder, but with dependent adult abuse and administering a harmful substance and prescribing a controlled substance without a legitimate medical purpose. In essence, the DA was alleging that Ruzrock tried to force or hurry Reuben's death just so that he, Ruzrock, could have access to those organs. It was the first case of its kind in the country, and if convicted, Dr. Ruzrock could spend years in prison. And then the whole world seemed to know. 
and this young transplant surgeon was made to look very guilty indeed. The San Francisco surgeon is He's now accused of speeding up a patient's death to get his hands on his organs. His lawyer advised, don't respond to any of it. The initial media attention soon migrated to the internet, but there, in an online stew of invective and invention, Ruzrock was said to be a possible Islamic terrorist or an angry Muslim who had not the slightest concern for an American patient's life. I was just amazed, you know. I was, I was like, these people don't even know me. I'm not even Islamic. I've never seen hate like I've seen hate in the last three years. People were giving us dirty looks. There were people throwing stones at our windows. Something dark, perhaps frightening about the case of Ruben Navarro and the surgeon Hutan Ruzrock. It was so sensationalized. It was so, for lack of a better word, made for TV movie. It was just so transplant surgery. Tries to kill somebody for their organs. Criminal charges weren't his only problem. Remember how Rosa Navarro said she was hounded by a doctor who lied to her, who tricked her into thinking there was no choice but to remove Reuben from his ventilator and let him die? Now, Rosa filed a lawsuit in which she charged that the doctor who told her those things was Hu Tan Ruzrock. Hu Tan Ruzrock sat at home in San Francisco and worried. He was in very serious trouble. And perhaps more serious, life-saving organ donations in the wake of such negative publicity were also in trouble. This was an extraordinarily not just interesting case, but important case because of its profound effect upon organ transplantation. Which is why attorney Jerry Schwartzbach called it the most important case of his long career. The DA's office knew that if they filed uh, charges against Dr. Ruzrock, they would be the first such charges ever filed in the history of law. Schwartzbach's a big gun attorney. Most recently he won an acquittal in actor Robert Blake's murder trial. And now? Well, a man accused of trying to hasten the patient's death just so he could, like some visiting vulture, harvest his organs. It looked bad. And perhaps it was. Early on, the judge had thrown out two of the charges, but he let the dependent adult abuse allegation stand and issued a gag order. So the public didn't know at all what sort of evidence Prosecutor Karen Gray had. Not until the first day of the trial, when the silence was finally broken and the prosecutor made her case. I'm Karen Gray, Deputy District Attorney, appearing on behalf of the people in this case. And within the first minute of her opening statement, she left no doubt what she thought happened in the operating room that night. The defendant, a transplant surgeon, administered excessive amounts of narcotics and tranquilizers to a young man in order to hasten his death so that he could harvest his organs. Prosecutor Gray is a former registered nurse, and as she placed one ampule of morphine and Ativan after another on the table, she explained how significant, how deadly that amount could be. So what we have is a situation where a transplant surgeon who was there to harvest organs is prescribing large doses of potentially fatal medications for a patient he didn't know anything about. The fact in this case that Ruben Navarro did not die in the operating room does not mean that he wasn't abused. Really? That's not at all how defense attorney Jerry Schwartzbach <clears throat> described it. He told the jury that all that morphine actually had very little effect on Reuben because he'd been on big doses of morphine for years. It went right to the heart of the case. While the amount of morphine administered that night would have been lethal for most people, it was insignificant for Reuben, who'd long ago developed a high tolerance. So, Schwartzbach asked, where was the abuse? If the amount of medication was excessive, it would have caused him injury or death. And it didn't. So yes. during the time he's in the operating room and you're waiting for him to die, he is getting morphine. You're just giving him more of it. Is that correct? Correct. In some sense, was that in order to hasten his death, to make it quicker and easier? It wasn't to hasten. It was simply to just make him comfortable. But what about that nurse, Jennifer Ensley? 
In her police interview and later in court, she claimed her memories of that night in the OR were very clear. Really? Listen, said the defense, to this description of Dr. Roosrock. He had a very thick accent. A very thick accent? In fact, she repeated that same point nearly an hour later in the police interview. He just had an accent. Roosrock was raised in Wisconsin, and as you've heard for yourself, has an American accent. Wary of all that negative pre-trial publicity, Schwartzbach knocked down allegations that weren't even brought up at the criminal trial. Rubin's mother, Rosa, remember, filed a lawsuit against Roosrock, an early version of which claimed Roosrock hounded Rubin's mother in the days before his death. Turns out Dr. Roosrock was in San Francisco that week, hundreds of miles away, hadn't even heard of Ruben Navarro. As of February 1, 2006, Dr. Rusrock had never been to Sierra Vista Regional Medical Center. He had never seen Rosa Navarro. He had never spoken with Rosa Navarro. Schwartzbach even provided an aggressive defense against disturbing rumors that Rusrock had something personal to gain from Ruben's organs. Did he have a financial incentive? Yo, we'll pay you per organ. He had no financial incentive. Did he have an incentive to rush things along? Quite the contrary. He was being paid by the hour. In fact, Roosrock was an employee of Kaiser Permanente Hospital and was only on loan to the transplant network as a courtesy service. Roosrock had been dispatched to San Luis Obispo that night to get a liver for a patient he didn't even know. The potential recipient wasn't Dr. Roosrock's patient. The potential recipient wasn't even a Kaiser patient. Dr. Roosrock's motive was to save somebody's life. The trial continued for weeks, much of the evidence and the testimony complicated, often tedious, while the jury waited for Rubin's vital signs chart to be admitted by the prosecution. That would be the forensic evidence that might tell them what happened in the ER. The chart could show that the morphine Reuben was given either had little effect or came close to killing him. But Prosecutor Gray told the jury Reuben's chart was nowhere to be found. There are missing records in this case. We do not have the documentation of Reuben Navarro's vital signs, which, according to the testimony, the transplant coordinator was apparently writing on a clipboard, but we don't have those. Um, and that's very unfortunate. And the person in charge of the chart? Carla Albright, remember her? She was the transplant coordinator, the one who set everything up, the quarterback, so to speak. If anyone knew what happened to that chart, it would be Albright. But the prosecution never called her as a witness. The jury will soon begin deliberating, but you... By the time the judge instructed the jury, Schwartzbeck was all but certain he'd taken the prosecution's case apart, but he had one nagging concern. Had the jurors heard all that heated pre-trial publicity and the way it characterized Hutan Roosrock? This kind of completely false, horribly unfair information was disseminated nationally. And if you Google Dr. Roosrock's name, you'll find that there's somebody out there who refers to him as a Muslim jihadist who uh, kills patients for their organs. If convicted, Roosrock would be a felon, maybe even sent to prison. His brilliant career would be finished. To Schwartzbach, a quick verdict meant success. A long deliberation meant problem. Thought they were going to come back in 30 minutes. But by the end of the first day, nothing. After the first day, did I miss something? Did they not get something? And no verdict by the end of the second day. You got your fate in the hands of 12 people you've never met. They didn't know what we did. They didn't understand half the words, medical terms that were used. Not because they weren't intelligent, but just they're not your peers. And that's what scared me. And every day, just a short distance from the defense team, and unpersuaded by their case, Rosa Navarro kept a lone vigil. It was wrong what they did to my boy. He didn't deserve to die like that. He died without dignity. No respect. And then, on the third day, at noon, there was news. 
please remain seated and come to order. Court is now in session. Mr. Foreperson, has the jury reached a verdict? Yes. I will ask the clerk to read the verdict, please. Superior Court of California, County of San Luis Obispo, the people of the state of California, plaintiff versus Hutan Ruzrak, defendant. In a small courtroom in San Luis Obispo, California, the jury had finally reached a verdict in the trial of Dr. Hutan Ruzrak. We, the jury, find the defendant, Hutan Ruzrak, not guilty of the crime. Hutan Ruzrak was embraced by relieved lawyers. Almost unnoticed, Prosecutor Karen Gray, without comment, quietly slipped out of the courtroom. And Rosa Navarro, still without the answer she sought, prepared again for the long trip home. I don't wish what's happening to me, to nobody. And though the jury sympathized, they could not find evidence that Hutan Ruzrak committed any crime. Well, I think the evidence certainly demonstrated that it was a mess. Uh, I don't think the evidence demonstrated it was a criminal mess. But they were puzzled, too, in their jury room about what they did not hear. If there's one person you really wanted to hear from and didn't, who would that have been? Carla Albright. Carla Albright. Carla Albright. Carla Albright. And why do you say that? She had all the records. She was the one who had passed on instructions to each of the other members of the team. Uh, she was the quarterback, as they referred to her. So why didn't you hear from her? That's what we were wrestling with after, after the fact. Where was she? Living in Florida, we found out. Why was she never called as a witness? We don't know. Carla Albright declined to be interviewed on camera, but she did issue a short statement over the telephone. Quote, Dr. Ruzrock had nothing to do with that boy's death. They filed a prosecution that based on all my experience, no competent ethical prosecutor ever would have filed. If this was um, a series of misunderstandings... You're being it, very generous, Keith. Well, how did it even get to trial? I just can't answer that question. I have, I have suspicions. Um, you know, I know people refer to him as, uh, you know, an Iranian doctor. They, they, they don't really focus on the fact that... Sure, they don't think you're... Racism is at the heart of this. Uh, I don't know what that was at the heart of it. I was quoted early on as saying if his, if his name was Joe Smith, I'm not sure that he would have been prosecuted. So why were charges ever filed against Dr. Ruzrock in the first place? Karen Gray declined our repeated requests for an interview, as did her boss. In fact, nobody from San Luis Obispo's DA's office would comment on the case beyond this brief written statement. The jury concluded the case was not proven beyond a reasonable doubt. After its verdict, though, the jury did ask to read a statement recommending that a common set of rules be put in place to govern DCD organ procurements. Defining the nationwide protocol for DCD organ procurements will be an important part of Ruben's legacy. But the jury couldn't know, of course. Is it because of Ruben Navarro's case, new national protocols governing DCD cases had already been put in place to guide hospitals and doctors alike? Before the prosecution of Hutan Ruzrock, even before a misinformed media helped derail his career. Do you have your reputation back? I don't think so. Will you get it back? I hope so. It's going to take a lot of hard work. I lost it in a minute, and it's going to probably take me a lifetime to get it back. After the trial, the California Medical Board, which had also launched an investigation of Dr. Ruzrock, quietly withdrew it. And Rosa withdrew her lawsuit. And this is rare. Her lawyer attached a letter of apology. We believe you acted ethically and in good faith Society will be best served if you're allowed to apply your talents as a transplant surgeon and continue saving lives. But what happened also to that long, desperate list of patients hoping an organ donation will save them? According to the Organ Procurement and Transplant Network, organ donations in the United States dropped for the first time ever when news of the case became public. Now, people die every day for lack of organs. This prosecution may well have caused more people to die than should have died. Perhaps it did. But the woman waiting for Reuben's liver did eventually get a transplant. 
and survived. And there's a little more hope now for others, because this month Dr. Hutan Ruzrock joined a new hospital and is once again performing transplants and saving lives. Finally emerging from that one night in the fog in California. <laughs>